join us as we work through the series uh, about add to your faith and we've now reached uh, godliness. And he's going to be speaking from 1 Timothy chapter 4 and I'll just read that before he comes. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such things come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry in order and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and to know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and on the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe, command and teach those things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, You will save both yourself and your hearers. And God will bless the public reading as we have already considered of his word. Thank you, Gordon. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. This morning, I want to uh, speak again on this subject of adding to your faith. And uh, so we'll just, uh, I just need a moment to pray again. So I'm going to pray. Thank you for your prayers, Ken. But I'll pray again just to still my own heart and just to hear from God and that we all might receive this morning what it is that the Lord has for us. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we turn to you. There is no other God. You alone are God. You're the great, the mighty, the all-sufficient God. We cry to you this morning, Father. We look to you. We pray for your presence and your, your work among us this morning. Be pleased to presence yourself here, Lord, and that your word to each of us would find a resting place in our hearts. And that, Lord, you would treat us each as individuals. You know us. You know our lives. You know the week we've had. You know the things we've done. We pray for your help again now. Lord, speak to us. Speak into us. Shape us. Mold us for your glory. Shape us for your pleasure. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing our Add to Your Faith series, 
And of course, this particular phrase, this particular idea, the series that we're working on comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, where Peter writes uh, to his various congregations, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith. And then there's a list of very important issues that we've been going through over the past weeks. He says, add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness. And godliness is where we come to this morning, uh, this incredible subject, uh, which has really overtaken me this week in my preparations for today and touched my own heart that I am uniquely or, or in a new sense aware of God's desire for holiness, for, for godliness. Here's a definition by a, 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 an old preacher called Stanley, Charles Stanley. A godly person is one who no longer seeks satisfaction through a sinful lifestyle, but is surrendered to God and his will for their life. It is a sanctified life. Another definition, godliness is the result of the habit of Christian obedience. I like that. Godliness is the result. It's an ending. It's a place we get to. It's something we grow into. The result of the habit. We know what habits are, don't we? Things that we practice in order to get better. It's the result of the habit of Christian obedience. And of course, any mention of Christian obedience is obedience to the Scriptures. And to become godly, in its essence, is to become more like God. To become more like God. So this morning, in terms of this huge subject of, of godliness, how do we whittle that down to make sense of it for ourselves in the short time we have this morning? I just want to draw out this, this chapter from the passage that, we've been, that, we've ha that Ken has read to us from 1 Timothy 4. Let me pick this up. For you have nothing to do with godless myths and old wife ta wives' tales, says Paul to Timothy. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise both for the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that, that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people and especially of those who believe. So, becoming godly, I want to say this first point this morning. First point this morning. Becoming godly requires serious training. It requires effort. Secondly, uh, becoming godly brings great blessings. Uh, and thirdly, uh, becoming godly involves doing the do's and avoiding the don'ts. We'll cover these three points this morning. Becoming godly requires serious training. Paul says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Godless myths, some of the godless myths that were around at that time that were affecting Timothy would be the traditions of the Jews, perhaps some of the Old Testament teachings. Some more, less biblical issues than that, that were just the fabric of ancient Jewish myths and legends and stories of ancient Jews that would be impinging on how the church behaved. Other, uh, other things that are summed up in this idea of godless myths would be the teachings of the Gnostics, who, of course, their view of salvation was this ascendancy to a, a, a spiritual realm where all matter was evil, but knowledge uh, entered a spiritual realm that was pure and good. So you left your body behind. didn't matter what you did with your body. You could really sin as much as you liked with your body, as long as you ascended to the secret knowledge that made you, that gave you contact with God. And Paul uh, generally defines all this stuff as godless myths. And there were different demonic ideas that were around that were completely challenging the idea of Genesis and the creation of the world. So Paul says, have nothing to do with these things. Alistair Begg, in one of his sermons, used a phrase. He says, after 35 years in ministry, I've made a great discovery that junk is junk. 
And uh, so he, he was saying, junk is still junk. Whatever you do with junk, it remains junk. You can eat it all your life. You can feed it into your brain all your life. You can watch it on telly or on the computer. But junk remains junk and does nothing else but clutter your life and is essentially our modern uh, sense of godless myths. Um, what other things would be affecting us today? Things like liberal theology, which is on the rise where the word of God is pages are being, as it were, cut out the Bible, where uh, uh, to, to satisfy the desires of liberal theologians, uh, big chunks of the Bible are defined as untrue or unnecessary for the modern day church. This is nonsense. Uh, it, it, it is junk. We are to dispense with liberal theology. What about the New Age movement? Is anybody dabbling here in things that are to do with New Age thinking? What about mindfulness? Mindfulness is getting room in the church because it has a form of godliness that is a lie avoid these things? What about uh, political correctness and uh, its whole issue of being the new righteousness? It's replaced biblical truth. We now walk to the beat, march to the beat societally uh, of, of political correctness. And I think these things are what Paul would say if he turned up in 21st century Scotland, have nothing to do with these godless myths. That doesn't mean we treat people unkindly or harshly, but it means we know where the truth lies. It means we know where to go to find what is rock for our lives, not what is uh, insubstantial and like sinking sand. We have to get the right training manual. And of course, if we're going to train ourselves in godliness, it requires to be the scriptures. The word of God, folks, is where we stand firm and secure. That is the, the guidebook for our lives. That is where our training needs to come from as we think about how we are going to live this godly life. There is so much information that is, that is beamed into our brains these days with, with uh, tweeting and with texting and with WhatsApping and with emailing uh, and and with everything else, half of the things that I don't know, I'm left well behind now in this whole uh, race for information and communication. But a lot of it is junk. And unless we realize it's junk and stop wasting our time on it, we will get caught up. And the training in godliness that is a high priority for Paul as he talks to Timothy in this letter will get left to the side and we are deceived by these things. The devil deceives us because our lives are cluttered. Our minds are cluttered essentially with junk. We need to get back to the training manual and apply ourselves there. Titus 1.1, 1, 1, Paul uh, says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect. This is him describing his mission and their knowledge of the truth. It's about the scripture. It's about the word of God. Why is that important? Because it leads to godliness. That's what he says to Titus. It leads to godlessness, the knowledge of the truth, getting into our Bibles, making the Bible work in our lives, setting ourselves to train to godliness according to the word of God. Train, the Greek word for train is the word gymnasio, from which we clearly get our English word gymnasium. Uh, and the word train in this sentence, as Paul uses, it means exercise vigorously. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, exercise yourself in godliness vigorously, vigorously. Make an effort. It's to be intentional. It's to be where we decide to, to do this thing. We are to apply ourselves to this. Uh, I see, I use the word intentionally. I, I I came across this fact that the word decision, our English word decision, comes from the Greek idea of cutting away that which is unnecessary and useless. You make a decision to apply yourself to that which is worthwhile and valuable. You decide, you evaluate the options. As in, a surgeon would make an incision, so in our lives we make decisions. And the decisions we make need to, according to the scripture, push away, cut away in a world that is pounding us with information. And most of it junk in terms of the kingdom life. We need to cut away. And maybe that requires some physical cutting away of the way we deal with phones and smartphones and computers and iPads and all of that. What are we doing? What is training us? What is shaping us? What's shaping you today? 
uh, we remember that Jesus said, cut away, cut away your hand if it leads you to sin, cut away your eye if it leads you to sin, take it out. In other words, uh, the emphasis is if something is leading you to sin, leading you away from godliness, then get rid of it, cut it out, make a decision, be intentional about your walk for Jesus. How often we drift along as Christians from one meeting to the next. We have transferred uh, living to be godly to living to go to meetings. Now, meetings are important. Meetings like this are important. If you weren't here, I would feel rather stupid. And, and I would feel what a waste because there's something very important here. And we come to meetings to learn the truth and to share fellowship around the world. But it's important that we go away and train ourselves, put it into action. But to train like Olympic, an Olympic swimming team member, uh, you, you hear about these guys. They're up at four in the morning and they're down the pool and they're the only person there. And they're training before they go to work and they're watching videos when they come home. They're watching their own style. What did they get wrong? What was right? They're watching other people who are better than them that they might grow in their ability to achieve, to perform, to be the best they can be. They're training themselves and that they're cutting away all the stuff that gets in the way of that. They cannot be in the Olympic swimming team if they're going to just lounge around and do other stuff that comes their way whatever happens it's very intentional so we, as christians i want to encourage you i want to i want you to leave here today thinking what daily decisions do i need to make to be intentional about godliness that is what do i need to cut away from my life what do i need to cut out of my life if i'm going to make more of my life for jesus christ how do i make more of myself for jesus is it just all happening to me? Have I got no role or responsibility within that? Here we see we have a huge responsibility. Yes, it is God who works in us, but it's our responsibility to work out what God has worked in. This is so important. Daily decisions, key choices, habitual commitments. Time and again, doing the right, doing the right, identifying within ourselves where our propensity, where our sinful nature is lazy, where our comfort zones are, where we're comfortable to stay in a place that is not moving us in a godly direction, but allows us to indulge our old self. Just sit, sitting in that place where we're comfortable when opportunities to make advancements in godliness are passing us by every day. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9, do you not know that in a race, here we're back to athletics, we're going from swimming to running, uh, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize, run in such a way as to get the prize. Now, church isn't a competition. Church is not a competition, and quite frankly, some of the stuff that goes on in church makes me think some of us think it is. We are trying to get to the top. Jesus says, if you're advancing in godliness, go to the bottom. Go down and look after everyone else. Go down and hold everyone else up in prayer. Go down there and see who needs, who's lost in the pile of church. Who gets overlooked in the things of, of, of the church? Go down a, a, and run your race there. Make an effort. Train yourself to be there for other people. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Not letting your old nature just say, I want the best seat. I want the first cup of coffee. I want to be this. I want to be that. I don't like it this way in church. I like it this way. Well, good for you. But there's more to that than just getting what we like to please ourselves. This is about becoming like Jesus. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it. Listen. We do it to get a crown that will last forever, for better or for worse. You see what's happening here? I think sometimes we take the scripture that says, when we see him, we shall be like him. And we think, oh, that's good. In the end, I'm going to be just like Jesus. Where's my uh, comfy slippers? Where's my pipe? Where's the television clicker? Boom, 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 boom. I'm going to be like Jesus in the end. It's going to be okay. Listen. 
we do it to get a crown that will last forever, for better or for worse. There is an aspect of what we are doing today that is shaping what will be our reality forever. Yes, we will be like Jesus. We'll be like Jesus in righteousness. But the life that we have lived is hugely consequential in terms of how God then deals with us in heaven. Yes, we will go to heaven if we know Jesus. Do you know Jesus today as your Savior? Do you know him? Have you asked him to save your soul from sin? Have you asked him to to bring you in to be one of his disciples, to accept you? Jesus needs to accept you. It's not about you accepting him. Have you asked him to do that? Have you said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom? Save me from my sins. And when you become a Christian, Jesus enlists you in his Olympic swimming team, spiritually speaking. When you become a Christian, you enter the race. You get into training. People here know about training. Some of us are in the gym a lot because we're building up strength and stamina for life and all sorts of things that we do. Spiritually, we just don't think about life that way, but we need to. We need to because we're going to inherit a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Paul says, I'm not just, you know, frittering my time away here. And he's talking about himself now. He practices what he preaches. No, I strike a blow to my body to make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. What does that mean? It means that he's working on himself that his own stubborn flesh, his sinful nature, will not trip him up. He will overcome him, his own flaws. He will put them to death, and he will live this new life because Jesus has enabled him to do it. And we'll look at that in a moment. On the subject of choices, practicing or training turns learning into becoming. God's will for your life and mine is that we become someone. We become someone who is godly, someone like Jesus, to look like Jesus. That requires your full and wholehearted involvement and participation. Your full and wholehearted participation. He has enlisted you into something that by practicing uh, uh, what, we, what we have learned. You know, if, 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 if you learn how to be an outdoor survival guy like Mears, Ray Mears, and you don't put it into practice when you're out in the field, you will die. Learning is for doing in church. Learning is for training. You become a pianist when you practice the piano. You could attend piano construction courses, uh, you know, every day for a week and know everything about pianos, you can, uh, you can attend the physics of sound. How is sound generated? Why is, should it be made this way, this way? You could, you, could, you could learn everything about a piano, but unless you practice playing it, you will never become a pianist. It takes practice what you know, and by doing, you become better at it. You can learn to love unlovely people when you practice it. Oh, I don't like that person. I don't, I don't like going to that group because, oh, no, they're not very nice. I don't, I don't want to be part of that coffee team because somebody spoke to me three years ago in a very harsh way. You know, you can learn to love unlovely people when you practice. You can learn to serve ungrateful people when you practice it. This is godliness, isn't it? This is Christ-likeness. This is doing the right thing when you don't get perhaps the right response. You can learn to deny yourself for Jesus' sake when you set yourself to practice it. The problem for most of us is, is that we have put precious little practicing into doing the stuff that we learn on Sundays. And we drift like a cork in the water. Our Christian lives are more akin to the metaphor of a a ship on the sea without a rudder, without an engine, uh, and we kind of drift And coming to meetings kind of holds us on course, but our intentionality to set our alarm clock up early and get into that swimming pool and practice, well, we're not quite there. How can we do this stuff? Because greater is he that is in you 
than he that is in the world. God himself has come to dwell in us that we might become godly, that we might live godly lives, that we might practice godliness and get better at it. Jesus said to the church of Laodicea, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out my mouth. Jesus is very clear, very straight when it comes to wishy-washy Christianity. For the church of Laodicea, Jesus indicates their discipleship was unremarkable. It had nothing about it that was impressive to him. They hadn't been working at it. They'd lost their way. Worse than that, they thought they were rich, and yet he says that they're poor. They thought they were clothed. And of course, the history is that they had great riches in the city and they had, they had uh, uh, works that produced garments and clothing. And it was a center for fashion. Just, just rubbish. And they thought they were rich in these things. Jesus says, no, these things, you're naked before me. You're naked. You're poor, you're naked, you're pitiful, and you're blind, he says. Uh, and Laodicea was a specialist center for for eyes and seeing and uh, for eye medicines and all sorts of things. Their godliness was very poorly developed. And he says, unless you sort that out, it's all over. I'm closing your church. Because God wants churches that are full of godly people. And the subject of choices, you're now determining the person that you will become who stands before Jesus. In your life right now, you are determining by your choices, by what you chose to do this week past, by what you chose not to do this week past, you're determining the person that you will become that stands before Jesus. And which one of us knows when we will stand before Jesus? Who are you choosing to become? Who is making you, you? What is shaping your life? Is it you? Have you got your hand on things to make sure that your life is moving in the right direction, knowing that one day you have to stand before Christ, being the person you are, with the life that you have lived? What choices have you been making to pursue these things? Do you like the person that you're becoming as a Christian? Is it time to change? Is it time to decide, I've got to move this up a gear seriously, a serious gear? So we see becoming godly requires serious training. Becoming godly brings great blessings. This is the encouragement to godliness. Paul says in verse 8 of 1 Timothy 4, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Godliness holds the promise of God's blessing as thunderclouds hold the promise of rain. And how good that is in a dry and weary land where there is no water. The present life, 10 random blessings that I came up with that are part of what it happens when you pursue godliness. There is power in ministry for godly people. If a, if a person has a ministry, a, a, an area of service, it becomes powerless to, to, to affect godly results when the person themselves is not living a godly life. So for anybody involved in, in Christian service, when you're doing what you're doing in the church, your role, your responsibility, we need to be godly in doing it, that there is power and effectiveness. Better to be someone who's serving coffee as a godly person and the power and influence that's there than somebody up here who is living a double life and is not godly uh, uh, and their ministry is powerful, powerless. There is wisdom and discernment. God gives wisdom and clarity to those who are godly. A clear conscience, the obvious one, comes with being godly. You can put your head on the pillow at night and sleep, and you're not worried about what you've said or what you haven't said or what you've done or who you've done it with and what you haven't done. You can, you're a clear conscience. You have joy. Joy comes with godliness. 
Joy is the thing that I think is the, is the, is the candy coating of hope. Joy is the forerunner that announces hope is coming. And joy comes with godliness. With godliness comes usefulness to God. You want your life to be useful for God as a Christian? Of course you do. Of course you do. But to be that useful person, that person who's equipped for every good work in the kingdom of God, we need to be godly. We need to be training ourselves. We need to be investing, making decisions, making ourselves grow in grace, practicing that habitual uh, stuff that is about walking with Jesus day by day and dealing with our attitudes and traits. This is the thing, the stuff that we live with, the character traits, where there's laziness or lust or pride. Pride is the biggie. Greed, materialism, idol worship, so that we do church, but we're living for ourselves in so many other areas, and we fail to develop in godliness. You know, somebody who's living a godly life, they, a godly life, they carry the Holy Spirit with them. They have fellowship with God. They, are, they bring God into things. How good is that? Somebody who is living a godly life their heart has changed because they've made a point of saying, Lord, I need a new heart. My heart is my problem. It's hard. It's stony. It's unkind. It's unloving. It's selfish. Lord, change my heart. Someone who is becoming godly has influence with others that is powerful and loving and effective. Others can be changed by a godly person. Godliness brings a sense of God's pleasure. Well done, good and faithful servant. You hear it in, the, in your ears as you're serving God and, and doing things that are a denial of yourself and a commitment to obedience in Christ. And a godly person lives a holy life that becomes a model. They become someone who says, as I follow Christ, follow me. As I follow Christ, follow me. Becoming godly brings great blessings in the life to come, Paul says. It, it holds promise for this life and the life to come. Uh, I, the idea of holding promise is interesting. It's as you practice your godly living, as you set yourself to become a more godly person, a more obedient person, a more Christ-like person, as you weigh up your priorities, as you look at what you do with your time, um, it's going to be an investment that you cannot yet see the fruit of it. You cannot yet see what's going to happen in heaven as you invest yourself in that godly life. But Paul says it's okay because he says, and I haven't quoted it here, but in the passage we read, it says, because we're trusting in the sovereign Lord. We're trusting in the God of all creation. We're trusting of, of, in the God who's given us his promises. It's his word. We can trust him because he has the power to do what he says. He has the power to bring these blessings to our souls, not only here, but in the life to come. And you are going to be in heaven, dear ones, an awful lot longer than you're going to be here. So the wise man, the wise woman says, Lord, let me live now with eternity in view, with that promise of blessing that will be mine one day that I can fall, pour my life out into the ground like that seed that has to die, that I can truly die to self and my selfish inclinations. Is it going to be my career or is it going to be all for Jesus? Is it going to be my will be done in this, this, and this with my money, my time, my hobbies, my holidays, my everything? Or is it going to be Jesus, what do you want of me today and tomorrow and the next day? Practice makes perfect because greater is he that is working in you to form you and shape you to give you a life that as you look back you have sought the lord you've served the lord you've given yourself to him you have denied yourself jesus said no one can come after me who doesn't deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me this is discipleship at its root at its core let me just show you some of these scriptures, Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person, that's you and me, according. According to what? According because they went to Bethesda. According to what? 
according to what they have done. And what will be the measure of the worth of what you have done? It will be according to the word of God. What does the word of God say that your priorities and mine ought to be? Are you training yourself in these things? Are you wrestling with these things? Is it easy? Absolutely not. If it was that easy, more people would be doing it. But Paul encourages us, he exhorts us in this passage to pick up this baton and to run the race with perseverance. James 1, 2 says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. What's the context? To obey God, to stay holy, to keep going for Jesus. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The converse of that is that if we don't persevere, if we don't make an effort, we will not be receiving crowns of life in the same way at all. So heaven is going to be a very diverse and different place across its whole spread for the billions, the millions that will be there. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. So the question then becomes, what are you sowing? What are you sowing? What are you sowing in your life today? How are you sowing spiritually in your life today? What are you planting that one day you will reap that's the issue. Hosea 10, 12 says, sow to yourself in righteousness and reap the fruit of unfailing love. Break up your fallow ground, your barren ground. You see, in our lives, there are aspects, areas of our lives where we are unfruitful. We remain so unfruitful given over against our potential to be fruitful. But if we train ourselves in godliness, we will bear more and more fruit to, to the glory of God, more and more fruit of leading more people to Christ, of being a witness and a worker for Jesus, that other people are blessed by the love of God through your life as you commit your life to new areas of service and ministry. Why? Because you're denying yourself. You're making decisions about what, what matters, and you're being intentional about it all. And although many blessings flow from godliness, the godly person will serve God and love their neighbor, not for blessing, but because they want to please God, whatever circumstances prevail. Therefore, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Do not merely listen to the word the scripture says and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. We have to be doers of the word. And that will mean taking ourselves to task, taking our nature to task, taking our favorite habits and self-indulgent times to task. Is this right before you, God? Help me to change. So finally, becoming godly involves doing the do do's and avoiding the don'ts. Practice what you say you believe. In verse 10, Paul says, this is why we labor and strive. Paul practices what he preaches because he knows the value of godliness. But it takes great effort to walk in obedience when the pressure is on. That is why we labor and strive, he says. There is a laboring and striving to keep going for Jesus. It's hard work when you practice this stuff, when you pursue godliness. And it's hard work dealing with yourself. It's yourself that is the object of what you're working on when you work on becoming a godly person. It's not really the context in which you find yourself. That may be hard. It may be easier. There may be good people around you. There may be difficult people around you. But when you're pursuing godliness, you're principally dealing with number one, with you. You become your own project. Paul said, puts it this way. I strike a blow to my body. We read that earlier in the passage from 1 Corinthians 9. Uh, that it might obey him, that he might conquer himself. He's trying to conquer himself, that he might be all that Jesus wants him to be. He knew the importance of working on his own life, not just working on other people. And then we come to the crux of some of this stuff, don't we? When we get to the scripture and the nitty gritty of how godliness is to be practiced. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, 
sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Now, for some of us in church, we may feel fairly comfortable and fairly smug because there's maybe not particular things there that we think that we're guilty of. So we kind of excuse ourselves from needing to listen too hard. Beware of doing that. You have your own areas. I have my areas of stubborn refusal to bow the knee to Christ. You have your own areas where you love to get what you want for yourself. And at some level, it is in conflict with the work of the spirit within you, who is leading you to deny yourself, to put that thing to death. How do I do it? You practice it. You practice it. You practice putting it away. You practice putting it off. You prayerfully pray about the root attitude and motive that's in your heart that that constrains you in that self-centered way. And you ask God to help you deal with it. And then you step out believing his help is there. Then you go to work to do differently, to do the right thing. Rather, here's some of the do's. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. I love that phrase, do not think how to gratify the desire. Do not make provision for your flesh. Do not make little plans about how you can indulge yourself in things that you know that God would disapprove of. Don't plan in advance. You know, when I worked in drug and alcohol work, it was commonly said, nobody wakes up one day and find themselves in a pub drunk with a pint in their hand and say, how did I get here? I don't know. <laughs> I sound like Billy Conley when I do that. Backsliding into habitual drinking or any other habitual things is a process by which we set ourselves up to give ourselves a green light step by step by step. And we move towards sin and we eventually sin. James puts it this way. First, there is the, the, the desire. Uh, and then there is the action to fulfill the desire. And then there is the sin, which is the full consummation of the deed. And following that, he says, there is death because the wages of sin is death. So beware your desires. Beware making provision for your flesh. That's what ungodliness is. Therefore, as God's chosen people, says Paul, holy and clearly loved, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and, and patience. Humility, examine your heart. James says we have to go to the word of God and look in it as in a mirror. Do not deceive yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror of God's word. Stop pretending that that area of your life doesn't need scrutiny. We're very good at looking in the mirror to see what's happening with little spots in our face and that wrinkle that's getting worse. I'm sure it's getting longer. These crow's feet are getting worse up there. Look at yourself in the mirror of the word of God and be honest with yourself. Do not be deceived. See what's the truth about you and set yourself to work on growing up in godliness out of the person you were when God saved you that you're transforming and being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And Paul again to Timothy, but you, man of God, flee from all of this sinful stuff and pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, he says, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Where would we be without pursuing more, a more effective prayer life? We will not do this unless we are in communion with God, saying, Father, help me, help me, help me practicing prayer as the prelude to practicing obedience. Jesus said, store up treasure in heaven. And here's something I want you to remember from this morning. With increasing godliness, you become your own treasure in heaven. You are your treasure in heaven. Because you have invested your life in godliness, the pursuit of godliness. And you become the valuable thing in yourself. No one can take it from you. 
And when you get to heaven, that, that, that promise that is stored up for you because of your godly life will somehow be made real. It will come to, your investments will, will be realized. You are the treasure. You are God's treasure in heaven. You yourself will be the treasure to your own soul because you have lived for God in godliness. Remember, you are now determining the person you will become that stands before Christ Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords. You are now determining because of what you've done last week, last month, last year, the last five years, the last 10 years, the last 50 years. Does God like the person you have become this far? Is it time to change? So we see becoming godly requires serious training. It requires, or it brings with it great blessings, though. And it involves doing the do's and avoiding the don'ts. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your goodness to us. We ask your forgiveness where we have been slow, Lord, where we have been slack, where we have had a take it or leave it attitude to the opportunity to grow up in our faith and put into practice the stuff that we hear week after week in church. We pray, Lord Jesus, that even as of today, we may decide to move up a gear in these things. And we ask for your help to do so. We cannot sanctify ourselves, but by trusting you and dwelling in your word and believing what it says and knowing that your power is with us, that we can change. We can change. We can overcome ourselves. We can beat our bodies and they will obey us because we will practice it, Lord. We will make it a habit and we will do it for your glory. No longer to live for myself, but to live for Christ alone. Lord, help us in these things. Hear us today and be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen.